18th century justice, fair rights, equal opportunity, religious freedom, progress. All of these words describe a particular man who lived during the turbulent times in North Carolina during the 18th century. Hi, this is your friend Carol with Piedmont Trails, and in this episode, we will revisit the 18th century and the colony of North Carolina and discuss the man known as Herman Husband. This is episode number 47, entitled Herman Husband and the Regulators, and we'll get started right after this short break. Do you find it difficult to research the 17th and 18th centuries? Here at Piedmont Trails, we share our techniques with everyone. Check out our videos on Piedmont Trails' YouTube channel to learn more, or you can visit our website at PiedmontTrails.com. Discovering the past shouldn't be a struggle. Learn how to overcome those obstacles and enjoy your journey today. Welcome back everyone and thank you so much for joining me today. For those who don't know me, my name is Carol. I'm with Piedmont Trails and for nearly seven years we have shared our journey to the past. And today we are traveling back in time to learn more about a man who was deeply involved with the regulator movement in North Carolina. Now before I begin, let me say just a couple of things. First, with any situation, event, or family history, you always have two sides or two versions of the true events. Okay? And then secondly, I would like to say we need to recognize these differences when we research and make sure we are giving each one equal time. Why is this important? Because looking into all sides of the story allows you to completely understand the situation. Now, with that being said, the group known as the Regulators originated in the Piedmont region of North Carolina during the year of 1765. They were a group of men consisting of mainly farmers at the beginning. But over time, their numbers swelled into the thousands, and they ranged from millers, miners, merchants, preachers, and the list can go on and on. These men were frustrated about several things that were going on in North Carolina at the time. And I created a little short list about their frustrations. Number one is taxes. North Carolina taxes and quick rents had to be paid with coin or currency. In other words, crops, livestock, bartered items could not pay your taxes during the colonial period in North Carolina. North Carolina was a colony with very little currency flowing through the counties. You can quickly see how low-income farming families would have a difficult time with this. Number two was con corruption. In North Carolina, many of the colonial county court systems favored the wealthy versus the poor. We find this in every county, every colony, not just one. But in North Carolina, it was becoming blatant with corrupted sheriffs, tax collectors, attorneys, and many more. Many people witnessed their paid taxes recorded as unpaid with the collector pocketing the money. It wasn't easy for a person of low colonial status to point a finger at an official or a person of high status. Most of the time, judgment would favor the elite. Number three, land titles. The land system in the Piedmont region was such a mess that literally it took years to receive a clear title or a deed for your property. Many people felt like they were getting ripped off or they were getting cheated by paying taxes on property that was not yet legally in their names. And number four, power abuse or abusive power. In North Carolina and other colonies, certain acts were carried out if a person failed to pay their debts. A person could be arrested or they could be placed in jail or items of value could be confiscated, such as a horse or cattle or a plow, etc. These items would be auctioned to the highest bidder and then sold. Now you would think if a person owed two pounds sterling in back taxes and their horse was auctioned for three pounds, do you think the owner would get the one pound left after the sale? 
In most cases, the answer was no. The justice system during this colonial period held those funds, and they classified them as fines or fees. Many families who were farmers could not survive without a horse or a plow. These items were part of their livelihood. So you can see these, there is a lot of frustrations going on with the onset of the regulators. But now let's take our attention to the man that we are focusing on today and share a little bit about his story and how he fits into the regulators. There are so many important factors with this man as with any person of the past. Everyone is important to their time, opinions, and principles, what they stood for. Herman Husband was born in 1724 to William and Mary Husband in Cecil County, Maryland. Herman's father lived his entire life in Maryland, and Herman's grandfather arrived in Maryland as an indentured servant and received his freedom and 50 acres of land in 1673. Herman's father owned an ironworks and had seven children, five living to adulthood. In 1739, George Whitefield visited Cecil County. If you've not ever heard of this gentleman, he is a man of great importance during the Great, great Awakening years, during the 18th century. Herman and his parents attended the sermon dated December the 3rd of 1739. Herman is at the age of 15 at this time. He kept the sermon and the visions that he saw that day in his mind all the way up until his death. He would later recall to anyone who would listen about the first time he heard George Whitefield speak. Herman stated that George was a prophet and he would tell everyone when the day of judgment would arrive. Over 1,500 people attended this actual event in 1739. It was huge. And Herman Husband was born again that day in the Spirit of Christ. He shares this with everyone who is willing to listen all throughout the years. Presbyterians in the area of Maryland at that time had become divided over the Great Awakening and what it actually stood for. Even though Herman attended Presbyterian services, he began moving from that particular faith to the Quakers. A great influence on Herman Husband during this time was Robert Barclay's um, pamphlet of a, Apology for the Ta True Christian Divinity. Let me say that again. It's Robert Barclay's An Apology for the True Christian Divinity, which was written in 1676, and Herman Husband owned a copy of this. He was given a copy by a friend who was with the Quaker faith. By 1743, Herman wasn't listed as a member. He, he was listed. By 1743, he was listed as a member of the Society of Friends. He was at that time a Quaker. Now, during this time, he had been working in his father's iron mine in Cecil County, Maryland. He married uh, a lady by the name of Phoebe Cox, and they had at least two children. Now, Phoebe died in childbirth in 1749. The following year, Herman, with four other Quaker men, purchased a 45-ton schooner, and they named it Charlestown. Herman decides to sail this schooner to Barbados to understand the trading practices of the Quakers. And by 1751, Herman is known as a merchant and a respected member of the Society of Friends. He purchases 30 acres of land in Cecil County, Maryland in 1754. Now land prices during this time in this particular area were skyrocketing and it wasn't long until Herman heard about lands available where but in North Carolina. He had already visited the Carver's Creek Meeting House in Bladen County, North Carolina. So he was already familiar with the terrain and the, the Quaker faith and how the merchants operated in that area. He was already familiar with that. So he goes back to Maryland and he establishes a land company with at least 10 investors. His mission was to buy 10,000 acres of land and write down the region's best cash crops, have a description of the soil, 
and create a map before returning back to Maryland. In September of 1754, Herman Husband traveled the Great Wagon Road and connected with the Trader's Path to reach Orange County, North Carolina. He purchases nearly 2,000 acres near Sandy Creek, and he also purchases two lots in Hillsboro where he builds a temporary home or a temporary house. So what happens next? Well, we'll find out right after this short break. What roads did your ancestors travel during the 18th century? Tens of thousands of people traveled from one colony to another. You can pinpoint the exact route they took and follow in their footsteps. At Piedmont Trails, we conduct extensive research on all the early routes and paths. If you follow the roads, you'll find the people. Now, back to the show. Okay, we left off in the Piedmont region of North Carolina, and Herman Husband has purchased land and he's built a house in Orange County. It was at this time that we find Herman as a very outspoken man. I can't say that enough. He's a very outspoken young man. He um, is in his mid-30s at this time, and he shares his opinions about corrupt officials, um, slavery, and religious prosecution in the area. He shares it with anyone um, that is willing to listen. And he also listens to others, and he learns more about oppression and the lack of opportunity for many of the people living in the Piedmont area. So what does he do next? He decides to investigate several complaints about a Rowan County land agent in 1755. The agent's name is James Carter. Now, allegedly, Mr. Carter was accepting currency for land and issuing receipts, but he failed to record the data with the land office. So Herman begins to investigate this, and he finds that some of this is going on and, and that Carter is actually embezzling the money. In fact, Herman even wrote to Lord Granville about the corruption, going into great details and offering proof. He notes approximately 200 cases but the local authorities do very little for the people. James Carter is actually elected as an assemblyman, and over 100 families lost their money and their lands to the devious acts that were carried out by James Carter. Herman Husband speaks out against the Vestry Act also, stating his opinions vocally to anyone who would listen. In 1758, nearly 700 men gathered to speak out against the Vestry Act and demanded the act to be annulled. Now, in case you're not aware, the Vestry Act in North Carolina was a tax to pay for the Church of England's churches and their ministers to pay for their livelihood. Many of these ministers were not even active in the Piedmont area, and they did not have current active churches in that area as well. But they were forced, the people were forced to pay a tax to pay for the ones that were in operation during the eastern portion of the colony. The tax also divided the North Carolina into separate parishes, for instance, St. Luke Parish in Rowan County and Dobbs Parish, which was a separate complete parish for the Moravian settlements in present-day Forsyth County. With the Stamp Act in 1765, Husband began looking deeper into civil government and how it worked. Prior to this, Henry McCullough, which was a wealthy landowner merchant living in London, shipped his son, Henry Eustace McCullough, to sell his 1.2 million acres of land in North Carolina. Now, his young son, Henry, inflated the prices of the land, and it greatly angered many people. And this occurred in March of 1765. A group of men assaulted Henry McCullough, near Sugar Creek, and this is known as part of the Sugar Creek War that occurred during that time. The land prices had risen to 8 pounds sterling to 12 pounds sterling per 100 acres. The normal price during this time range often varied between 2 pounds and 5 pounds per 100 acres, so you can greatly see that the prices more than doubled in that area of the McCullough lands versus in other areas of North Carolina. 
Now let's move on in order to introduce, well, I want to move forward in order to um, introduce Edmund Fanning and North Carolina Royal Governor William Tryon. Now Fanning was a close uh, friend of Henry McCullough, very close. They were comrades. And Fanning had arrived in North Carolina just a few years after Herman Husband in the late 1750s. Now during the 1760s, Edmund Fanning joined forces with Henry McCullough, and he secured a seat on the Salisbury Superior Court in Rowan County. There was a popular song that was often heard in all of the local taverns throughout Rowan County, Mecklenburg County, um, the new county of, of Surrey County, and the, the words to the song, I'm gonna, not going to sing it for you guys, but I'm going to say what the words are. It starts out, When Fanning first to Orange came, he looked both pale and wan. An old parched coat upon his back, an old mare he rode on. Both man and horse weren't worth five pounds, as I've been often told, but by his civil robberies he's laced his coat with gold. Now Fanning, Edmund Fanning was one of the most despised men that lived in the Piedmont region. Previously, in North Carolina's history, it was the planners of Eastern North Carolina that held the power um, of the local legislatures and assemblies. But times were changing, and now it was becoming obvious that new lawyers and merchants and other professions dominated the power positions, and their influence controlled the legislature and the judicial functions of every county in North Carolina during this time. They controlled the taxes, they controlled the fines, they controlled the confiscations of property, they controlled the auction sales, they controlled the courts, the elections, and they even selected juries. North Carolina exploded with corruption, all under the power of Royal Governor Tryon. In 1766, Tryon was notified that the legislature approved 5,000 pounds for the new governor house. Tryon told the legislature that the amount was not enough and that the amount that he was needing was 10,000 pounds to construct his governor's house. So the state legislature approved raising taxes for all of the people living within the colony in order to provide the necessary funds for what's known today as Tryon's Palace. According to some historians, the word palace during the colonial period referred to any public building or residence, but this, my friends, is completely untrue. The colonial vocabulary used the word palace to define a grand residence or a royal residence, someone who lived in that residence of great importance. They were a diplomat. They held power. Tryon's palace was a power play between the people of North Carolina and the British government. It was the last straw for the regulators. They now did not want to negotiate. They didn't want a truce. They wanted revenge, and they were seeking violence. During this period, Herman Husband was elected to the legislature, but he this was all done in vain because all of his petitions were actually tabled and they were never to resurface for discussion or up for any debate. He was later expelled from the legislature in 1770 and was arrested and actually jailed until February of 1771 when he was acquitted by a grand jury. The reason why he was expelled from the legislature is they were charging him with treason and a riot broke out in Hillsboro during this time period, and the several of the regulators burst into the courtroom. Uh, Judge Richard Henderson is presiding over the court, and they threatened him. They actually took Edmund Fanning, who was present in that court, drug him outside of the courthouse, and literally beat him. Um, they stopped with that, and they rushed straight to Edmund Fanning's house, and they just, just destroyed it and vandalized it. And due to that, they felt that Herman Husband led those riots. 
and that's the reason why he was expelled from the legislature and he was arrested and then jailed but a jury of his peers acquitted him and then they released him after his release Herman tried to obtain a truce between the regulators and Tryon but it was much too late for that and the Battle of Alamance was actually fought on May 16, 1771, and it occurred between a thousand militiamen that Tryon had called upon and 2,000 regulators. But I want to um, reiterate here uh, and say something about the regulators. Not all of them had arms, and they were not all um, prepared to go to battle. Many of them had clubs, um, and thing, knives and that, uh, things of that nature to protect themselves with, with the battle. Not all of them were carrying muskets. On that day, on May 16, 1771, Herman's husband left North Carolina and he never returned. He never came back. He lost over 7,000 acres of land that he had purchased here. And he lost several of his personal items and... I guess what would be very important, he lost his cause. He traveled to Maryland and eventually settled in Pennsylvania, where he was joined by his family, his wife, and his son in 1772. Herman Husband goes on living in Pennsylvania until his death in 1795, but he is known for several events between 1771 and 1795, and one of these is the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, but that deserves a whole nother topic in itself. So let's summarize Herman Husband and see if we can figure out his reasoning and his actions leading up to May 16, 1771. And I want to read a quote from Herman that was written soon after the American Revolutionary War. And I would like for everybody just to listen carefully to his words as I quote him. And I'm quoting Herman Husband. And to you an open door is now set, which no nation before you ever had. You may now hold the crown without the use of a sword or a gun forever. And if tyrants oppose you, they must throw off the mask which they have ever wore to deceive you. They must openly fight against all the principles of their own societies and all the principles of our constitutions, which they have solemnly swore to defend. When you listen to the words of Herman Husband as he, when he wrote that, you hear opportunity, you hear freedom, and you hear hope, and you hear justice. For me, these are the exact words that I would use to describe Herman Husband. He was a man who cared enough to change the wrong and try to make it right. He once said, a man who will make a good mechanic or a good farmer who can rule his family well is also capable with a few years practice to make a good assemblyman to run the state. I'm sure he said this during the time when he was running for legislature in North Carolina, but he, in any of his quotes, he's always optimistic, and he's always believing that all people deserve justice and equal opportunities. So in our analysis, Herman Husband was a natural leader, and he knew it. In other words, he used his skills to encourage, influence, and change others. The corruption that was going on in North Carolina is so similar to the actions that were taking place in other colonies. You know, often our history books tell us that Boston, Massachusetts felt the wrath of the British control, but I think it's long overdue to share the other areas that endured just as much, if not more, before the American Revolutionary War. North Carolina Governor Tryon lost the touch with his people, and he encouraged his administration to live on the spoils of other men's labors. Herman Husband tried to change that, and at the same time he tried to prosper his colonial status and his family's wealth. There's no wrong in that, 
You know, a lot of historians will claim that, oh, he was a coward. He left. Um, he didn't stick it out. But his religious beliefs would also set examples for future generations. The man who wanted to change the world actually died at a small tavern just outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, just one month after his release from jail during the Risky Whiskey Rebellion in 1795. So what do you think Herman's last thoughts may have been before he was left this world? And, you know, it, you always try to analyze things. To How do you think people responded? What do you think he was thinking? And I can just imagine him saying, I could have done so much more. Knowing what I know now, I could have done more. So let's wrap up today's show. All right, now if you've enjoyed the show, then let us know about it. If you are interested in our current research projects, then follow us on social media, or you can subscribe to our website at PiedmontTrails.com. It's free to do that. You can easily sign up. I want to thank our podcast platforms for allowing us to broadcast our episodes for free and be able to share that all with all of you. I recommend the following reading material to learn more about Herman Husband and the Regulators. Uh, the first recommendation I have is a book entitled Redemption from Tyranny. It is written by Bruce E. Stewart, a very good book, and it goes into detail about Herman Husband's life. Um, second resource I suggest is far as a book named Farming Dissenters, the Regulator Movement in Piedmont, North Carolina. This book was written by Carol Watterson Troxler. It's an excellent resource. And in the back of this book, she also gives a list of regulator names. And I want to stress here, now, she gives approximately maybe, um, I'm going to say 500 to 600 names in her book. But I want everybody to be made aware of, there were over 2,000 members of the North Carolina Regulators from 1765 to 1771. And, you know, we would like to in the future maybe comprise a list of all of these names and the proof that identifies them as supporters of the Regulator Movement. Um, third thing I want to share is I also want to encourage you to research the colonial, colonial records of North Carolina if you look into the letters from Governor Tryon, Edmund Fanning, and also into Waddell, those letters that correspond with, with one another from May 19th to July 6th of 1771 go into detail about where Waddell was traveling, how, where was Fanning, and what they were doing to capture all of these regulators who did not surrender at the Battle of Alamance. Some of the tortures that were carried on, the marches that were um, that they were forced to make all the way from their home site to Hillsboro. There's a lot of detail in those letters. And we may have an article coming out soon about how the regulators were treated from May 16th to June 20th and then the other events that happened after that. Many of the regulators left the area completely. We've, we've always stated that. And number four, we encourage everyone to look deeper into the actual Stamp Act of North Carolina, the Vestry Act, and the Sugar Creek Wars that occurred in North Carolina. Okay, our next episode will be coming out next month. And until next time, my friends, thank you so much for joining me today. Enjoy your journey to the past, and may God bless. <music>